uh, composer David Ari Leon um, about his uh, his work and his work in the composing field as a music supervisor. Um, uh, so what, what sparked your interest in music and what led to film and TV composing? Well, okay, so I guess it's two parts of a question, what sparked my interest and then what led to film and TV. Um, they're definitely two separate questions. I grew up loving records. You know, I grew up listening to the Beatles and um, Peter Gabriel and Pink Floyd and bands like that and loved that music and was passionate about it and decided I wanted to study it in college. I didn't necessarily even set out on a mission to do it professionally. I had the privilege to be able to say, well, I want to study this. And so I, I just set out on that path to learn more about it. So that kind of led me onto the path of music originally. And then while I was studying music at UCLA, I had a class with a professor named Roger Borland. He's now the head of the composition department there. And he said to me, uh, one day he pulled me aside from class and said, uh, would you be interested in doing an internship with the film composer? And I said, sure. <laughs> and so he, <laughs> he connected. And, I mean, I, I loved film music. You know, I had some of the records I had were, you know, John Williams and the Rocky soundtrack. And I, I did love movie music underscore as well as songs. You know, right. they used to be, you know. So, um, but so I, uh, that internship was with Mark Isham. And I fell in love with the process of making music for movies during that internship. And, and it kind of set me on the path of, ooh, I want to give this a go and pursue it and see if I can do it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, working with somebody like Mark Reisham, who's, uh, I, love, I love his music, and uh, I've got to meet him on a, several occasions. Uh, what, what's the most valuable thing that you learned working with him? Wow. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I learned a lot of valuable things. Um, I mean, what comes to mind first, is to trust your instincts. Um, he was working on a film when I was interning with him, starring Robert De Niro. I think the film was called Jackknife. And the director had tempted the movie with Mark's music, and then Mark scored a chunk of the movie and delivered the score, and, and the director didn't like it. Wow. And the director said, I want you to redo it. And Mark, <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm, you know, 19-year-old college kid, and I'm listening to this phone call, and Mark's on the phone with the director, and Mark says, well, um, I did what my instincts told me to do, and if you don't like what my first instincts are, you probably won't like what my second instincts are, so I recommend you get another composer. And uh, that was uh, something that left a big impression on me of, wow, you know, trust your instincts as step one. Yeah, wow, that's, <laughs> I mean, I think everyone has a, I mean, talking to a lot of composers, a lot of people have experienced that where, you know, even the greatest composers, they their scores get rejected, so. Yes. And uh, so as a composer, you know, you talk about trusting your instincts, and you, you know, you, you're presented with a, a film or a TV show. Um, what's the first thing that you attach to? Is it the story, the plot? Or, or the setting. I mean, music encompasses all of it, but what speaks to you the loudest? Um, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes m music will already be tempted in, or, or I'll get some feedback from a director about a style or, or an approach, and I'll take that into account and look at following that as an assignment. And if it's left to me to advise, then I'll sit with it and... and at first viewing, I try to, to the best of my ability, let my emotions be my guide and, and tell me what the story is. I mean, obviously, the most important thing is that you connect on an emotional level. And I, I think you and I and people who are passionate about music see that as something obvious. But um, I've had, <laughs> I had a funny story recently. I was doing a pilot for a Disney show, and I uh, said to the producer uh, something along the lines of, well, you know, I, I think I'll make some music that will add some emotion to the story. <laughs> and th they, they didn't get it. Like, they, they looked at me like, like, hmm, like they were trying to, you know, figure out if, almost like it was, a, is that a good idea or not? You know, like, um, <laughs> 
kind of funny that it, it wouldn't be obvious to everyone that ultimately if you're not evoking an emotion with your music, you're not really doing what music is, you know, on a basic level meant to do. All right. Um, so I try to I try to connect on an emotional level and and not pick it apart analytically too much. And then once I kind of get inside the narrative and the story, then I'll I'll kind of try to you know think through understanding maybe a, a genre or a, a feel or or even a, a model mm-hmm. and 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 try to dial in the approach that way. And. Uh... That's 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 good. And you also, you know, you're talking about models and stuff, and and you've served as a a music supervisor on a lot of projects, including a huge amount of uh, Marvel animated features and and shows. And and I I talk to a lot of composers, but I'm always I'm interested in the music supervisor role. And and like, what what's your relationship as a music supervisor? What's your relationship to the project and working with the composer? And what is the goal of that position? Yeah, I think. Even as a composer, my approach is informed quite a bit by my background doing music supervision. As, as you said, I've done a lot of that. And as a music supervisor, the initial step is really the same as, as a composer. Like we talked about establishing an approach, a style, a direction, a feel, kind of overseeing, facilitating, making sure that that vision is realized. You know, the only difference is as a composer, I'm the one making the music, and as a music supervisor, I'm not the one making the music. Mm-hmm. And um, so it, there's sort of two facets of music supervision. One is the placement side, where looking for music that already exists to score um, with the pre-existing music. And, and you know, some of my favorite movies were scored with existing songs. I mean, kind of dating myself here, but I grew up loving this movie called Harold and Maude, and the movie was pretty much scored with songs by Cat Stevens. Mm -hmm, Yeah. And um, it was just really effective. It left a big impression on me, um, both in terms of what music can do in a movie, but in terms of what you can do just scoring with pre-existing music. And and so that side of music supervision, doing placements, I always look to um, be be as creative and and, um, effective as possible. And then the other side of music supervision is working um, with composers and music producers to create the music custom for the for the picture. And that I'm I'm typically pretty hands on as far as that goes. I'll you know work with them on making sure we have an approach that really serves the story. And then I'll I'll be available to be in the studio with them. And you know I, I do my best to not micromanage and and, you know, stick my nose in too much since I'm not the creator. But, you know, I, I do um, tend to be opinionated about these things. I'll, I'll confess that. And, mm-hmm. and, I, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm hired to give my opinion. And now that I've been doing it for over 20 years, I have clients who expect me to give my opinion and look to me to give feedback to the, you know, composers and producers and make sure that the vision is is what I think the producer and the director want. Right. And so so what happens if, you know, if a composer that you're working with, or even if yourself working with a music supervisor, if you're on that other end, if you have differing viewpoints or differing, you know, everyone has their own what they think the, the, the voice should be. And so what happens when you have, like, how do you compromise if there's, a, you know, some sort of conflict between that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, at, th- at this point... I try to avoid conflict, <laughs> um, and the best way to do that is to really get everyone on the same page from the beginning mm-hmm. and to be clear of what the vision is in terms of the musical style and the feel and the approach and direction and so forth. And, and once everyone is, is aligned and the director and producer are aligned and you know the composer and music supervisor are aligned, then you're, you're most of the way there. If that makes sense, uh-huh, yeah. And and then, yeah. And uh, and then it's di- dialing it. You know, it, it sometimes assignments are a little more complicated than others. You know, when you have things that kind of incorporate multiple styles and feels. I mean, some of the most fun types of music to do are are where you have a hybrid approach, and maybe it's you know 
Um, I mean, I, I love doing, you know, song meets score, kind of like what Trent Reznor is doing, that kind of hybrid approach. Or mm-hmm. you might have um, different kinds of elements. I'm doing one project right now where it's literally this fusion between world music elements and Americana elements and traditional underscore elements. And so that can be a bit more tricky to dial in the percentages. Do you want 20% world music or 40% world music? So that that takes a couple passes. But, you know, in those cases, you, you'll you do a couple cues as, as kind of test runs and make sure that you kind of have the, the balance right. Right. And make sure everyone signs off on it and then move forward that way. I mean, yeah, it's hard to put, a, I guess, a quantitative measure on, you know, I mean, in terms of, you know, you need a certain amount of music, but to put, yeah, in terms of styles and aesthetics, how do you, how do you quantitate that? <laughs> It's really tough, you know, because at the end of the day, you want something cohesive that makes sense as its own entity, right. you know, and that, that can be more challenging, but it also can be more fun because in my experience, a lot of times you'll get a project that the, the directive is to do a score that is, I would say, conventional or safe, and um, that is oftentimes less creative. It's, it's more relying on craft. Um, and some of the stuff where there is no safe uh, approach is a little more challenging creatively, but it's a little more fun because you kind of get to explore some of the video games that I've been scoring for the Chilingo division of EA recently are good examples of things where there's just absolutely no safe approach. I, I scored this game called Contrajour that was... Um, Let's see, I guess Apple voted it the best iPad game of the year in their iTunes Store Rewind last year in Mm -hmm. something like 10 countries. And it was really fun, and the game's really getting great reviews and feedback. And basically, you're flinging an eyeball around the screen with, like, rubber bands. And, you know, you you look at this and say, hmm, well, I have no idea what should be here. There's there's absolutely no convention. So you kind of get to play around with what the mood is. And... And it's it's fun. It's you know it sort of brings you back to wow. I'm you know I'm privileged to be able to actually be creative and be involved in a creative process and and make music. It's fun. Right. And I mean, you, you talk about doing these uh, these mobile games and mobile apps. And I remember I was at a Q and A a few months ago, and oh, maybe a year ago, and they were talking how composers like this is kind of the new frontier. You know, video games have mm-hmm. been always in the home, and they've slowly you know, you have these full orchestral scores now in console games, but now you have the mobile games, the iPads, and and it's do you, what 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 other challenges do you find? Do you find it it's like a to bring you know interactivity to your writing approach? How does that you know, work? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's it's a lot of fun for me to do. I've been doing a lot of these uh, mobile game apps, and a couple of them are are big names like Woody Woodpecker and Superman that kind of have an established sound that you would expect. And on Superman, Mm -hmm. the assignment was sound like John Williams' Superman score. And um, that's a challenge um, without, you know, especially when you're kind of sitting in a room with, you know, flashing lights and knobs and you're listening to a, you know, 100-piece orchestra um, that was recorded live and going, how do I sound like this? (laughs) <laughs> but it, but it's fun. It was a good challenge, and the game is doing well, so that's nice. And then a couple of the other, the other games are are just like we were talking about the the kind of chance to experiment more, where you just have these crazy wacky things. And um, I kind of feel like doing video game music is an experience that's halfway between scoring to picture and just making music for music's sake, like say you're making a record or an album. Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're, you kind of have this, you know, kind of coming back into the, um, the basic fundamental mood and, and feeling of it. You, you, you can look at whatever imagery you have and be informed by it, but you can't really score to the picture. You, you can't really know what's gonna, what you're going to be seeing when you're going to be hearing the music with the games. So you're kind of, I mean, for me, I guess speaking for myself, I'm, I'm envisioning 
playing the game and seeing the general imagery as I'm making the music and I'm letting that inform the music that I'm making. Um, but then I actually have a lot more freedom than when I'm scoring to picture. As you know, if, if I'm writing music right to the image on the screen and I'm making a piece of music and it's really developing nicely as a piece of music and then all of a sudden, you know, somebody walks in the door or, or the action changes the mood, then I have to take a left turn and I can't really let the music evolve musically. I have to now just completely change the mood of the music. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a limitation to picture, whereas with video games, I really get to make music from a more musical place where I'm, I'm, I'm starting with the mood and I get to end with the mood. So I get to evolve it you know, as, as a composer, I get to think a little more kind of like, I mean, I, I don't want to say I'm Beethoven, I'm certainly not, but I get to think a little more like I would think Beethoven would be thinking, like <laughs> like making music that's m musical, you know what right, I mean? Right, yeah. That makes sense musically. Okay, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, you touched on talking about, uh, you know, when you say words like Marvel or Disney or, or Looney Tunes or DC Comics, they these universes they have they immediately conjure up certain sounds, images, and styles, and and I think music should always speak to the individual story that it's accompanying. But if it exists in such a specific universe or a brand, should that music speak to that as well? I mean, you talked about scoring a Superman game and having it sound like John Williams, or if you're working in a Marvel or supervising a Marvel project, you try to make it sound Marvel? I mean, does that make sense, what I'm asking? Or Yeah, it does. It, it's hard to not think back to the stuff that, you know, we've already experienced with these kinds of brands. I mean, if I get asked to do something for Disney, I think back to the things that I loved for Disney growing up, and, and you know, same goes true with Marvel and all the other mm -hmm. projects. And, um, that sometimes can w work in, in, in a favorable way and sometimes in a negative way if the producer or director want to do something that's kind of standing alone or, or veering away then um, it's really important to make sure that 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 directive is clear up front and and then try to get a sense from them okay if you don't want that then you know do you have a sense of what you do want then that's when I, I really will try to spend some time establishing what a musical vision is, you know. And, and some, some producers, I mean, there's a pretty wide, I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, there's a pretty wide range of musicalities that a director or producer will have, all the way from being musicians to really being pretty unmusical. <laughs> yeah. And um, so... It, um, it's important in, in my experience to try to get a sense from them, whatever it is, even if it's just in um, very basic non-musical words. I mean, what I say to people all the time when I'm working in a, as a music supervisor is, is one of the hats that I have to wear the most often is translator. And it's sort of finding out from somebody who doesn't really speak music, what it is that they're wanting, and translate that to what the music actually sounds like. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. So that's that's helped me as a composer too to kind of work as a translator and try to work with the director and producer and say, okay, well, you want this emotion, so you know, what about this as a, as a model? And I do try to these days. It's really easy to pull up a link to music somewhere and, and shoot an email and say, here's one or two examples of things that I'm kind of thinking as, as a starting point. And maybe it's just this kind of a, of a drum groove or this kind of a um, violin part or, or something to, as a starting point. You know, that's always the most difficult thing is getting the initial starting point. Once, once we have that and people are saying, ah, I like that as a starting point, then it's much easier to dial in the remainder of the approach. Right. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, it's a huge juggling act, I think, just trying to, I mean, I, I guess I'm not a, I'm not a musician. I, I'm, I come from a 
writing, directing standpoint, but I just uh, music is very important to me in terms of structuring uh, whatever you know the scene or I I write to music script wise and but it's just when you have trying to get buckled down it's a, it's a huge that's why I love talking to people like you and just trying to you know gather as much information as I can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, got it. Um, but uh, cool. to wrap things up, uh, I guess I like to, I like to ask composers this question: um, if you if you had the opportunity to score any film ever made, with no disrespect to the original composer, what film would you choose? Wow, um, gosh, I I could think about that question for a while. <laughs> um, <laughs> any film ever made, which one would I choose? Well, what? comes to mind uh i guess I, the immediate thoughts that i have are movies where the score just blew me away emotionally and i went wow if i scored a movie like that i would and i never scored a movie again i would feel like i'm a badass for doing that <laughs> and um you know for example um Tommy Newman's score for American Beauty um, was course, just yeah. so groundbreaking and, and so evocative and, and, and uh, so unique at the time. And um, yeah, if I could score that movie or make a stamp like that, then I can't think of something I would be more proud of. That's a good answer. I don't think anyone has said that. But um, uh, thank you so much. David, for taking the time. Uh, this has been great chat, very informative, very enlightening, and uh, hopefully we get to do it sometime in the future. Great. Yeah, it sounds good. Thank you for having me.